There's another way in which this, this great firewall metaphor and, and our reliance on it really kind of paints a false picture of what's really happening in China. And that, that, that's this. Um, we imagine that the Great Firewall's purpose is to prevent people within China from accessing sites outside of China, the ones that we all know are blocked. You know, YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and, and, and Google now is, is blocked. And that is where presumably the truth resides, right? That they're, they're blocked from accessing the truth, which is hidden between the cute cat videos on YouTube and pictures of my lunch on Twitter. And somewhere there is the truth, right? And that those poor Chinese internet users who are stuck behind the Great Firewall, because they can't get to Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, they're not able to access the truth. Now, there's a, there's a study that was done just up the road here in Evanston by a, a guy by the name of Harsh Taneja, who now teaches at, at, uh, at the Columbia School of Journalism in, in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, he did a uh, really interesting study on why it is that something like 97% of page requests originating within China for internet pages are for pages that also sit within the geographic confines of the People's Republic of China on servers in China. Why is, why is that? Is it, as he asked in, in this paper, is it access denied or is it access not wanted? And, and what he found out was that China is really not much, to, his, his assumption going into this, of course, as anyone's would have been, was that this is a, 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 a function of the fact that the Chinese internet prevents access to a lot of, of, of websites outside of China. What he, what, as it turns out, if you look at most other ethno-linguistic groupings in the world, whether you look at Portuguese speakers in Brazil, whether you look at, at, at Polish language users, whether you look at any other ethnic group, with the exception of some northern European languages, uh, countries where, where bilingualism or multilingualism is absolutely commonplace, you find the same phenomenon. That, that people in, for example, it's not even just language. For example, Portuguese internet users do not visit Brazilian sites. They visit only Portuguese language sites in Portugal. And likewise, Brazilians don't visit a lot of Portuguese language sites. In, in the English language, it's different. You know, we, we do quite a, quite a bit of transatlantic and all, all the way to Australia. But uh, it's quite different for um, even you know, languages like German or French. Or, or Russian, they, they, there is the same sort of uh, unforced geographic containment. So what, what, I'm, what I'm really saying here is, is that we are barking up the wrong tree when we think that the problem of, of internet censorship in China is the prevention of Chinese internet users from getting on these mostly American uh, sites like Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. In fact, uh, the real problem of Chinese internet censorship is much more onerous, much more deep-rooted, and much more difficult to actually, for any of us well-intentioned Americans or Europeans to actually address, which is domestic internet censorship, which is censorship that is of Chinese language sites that's often done in a sort of outsourced way. It's not just the, the, the mechanical blocking of, of keywords uh, for, you know, from, at the ISP level. It's internet censorship that's done by the operating companies themselves, by the operators of Sino Weibo or Silang Weibo, by the operators of, of Weixin, which is Tencent, of course, by the operators of the search engines like Baidu. They actually have to, at the behest, at the, at the insistence of, of the Cyberspace Administration of China, they have to block these things. 